Hi everybody, welcome to the third video in this sequence for week three of Chem 670. And what we've already done in this particular course is thought about what our audience is looking for. Um, who is our audience and how do we connect with them? As we connect with them, we also want to connect characters and actions and ideas because at the end of the day, we're trying to communicate our science. In this video today, we're actually going to think about the idea that we're teaching that audience and that we need to provide them with new information. That's why they're coming to us to learn from our writing in the first place. So how do we do that? How do we connect all these complicated ideas in a way that a reader can understand? Well, let's take a look. So let's start again with our opening page uh, with the subtitle writing clear, concise and compelling. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that the reader and the audience takes note of what we're saying. And we'll also come back to our outline for this particular sequence of videos. And we've already talked about uh, aligning with the audience, uh, the image we're trying to portray and how we connect ideas, uh, characters and actions together. So what we're now going to look at is the idea of the context um, and that is assumed and established information. So we have to think about the reader's mind. Um, and so in this slide, I'm going to talk about assumed and established information. So we will make an assumption that a reader knows um, a certain amount, a foundation on which we're going to build what we might teach them. So we're going to put the assumed information, the information we think they they already know, we're going to put that close to the beginning of sentences. So we obviously have to make the correct assumptions about our, what our readers already know. So we have to, of course, think about who our audience is. And we have to, of course, always provide the context for what we're going to tell them. We have to root our audience in that context. Let's look at an example here. Um, I'm going to put up a series of sentences over the next few slides. And the first of these sentences is the efficiency is driven by photo induced charge transfer processes. What we automatically recognize is that, again, we must put that assumed information close to the beginning of the sentences and the correct assumptions must be made. In this case, I'm assuming that the audience knows what efficiency is and that that is recognizable. So we know efficiency is recognizable. However, this concept of photo induced charge transfer processes uh, is not uh, already recognizable by the reader. Uh, and this becomes, however, established through the writing. This will be the important point of the paragraph that I'm about to provide the audience. So I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of establishing new information, establishing it as old information so that we can move forward uh, in our writing. So in order to establish information as old, that is, we're going to provide information to the reader that they don't already know, but we're going to set it up as uh, as old as, as if it were familiar to them. How do we do that? So what we do, first of all, is we think about the information that readers think will be unfamiliar or difficult to understand. but that information that we want to use as old information in later sentences. So often this might be the point topic uh, for a particular paragraph. In our particular example here, we're going to consider this to be photo-induced charge transfer processes. That was the object statement in the prior slide. So that is the information that we want to be able to use it again and again. We want to establish that as old information for our readers. We're going to put that information toward the end of a sentence. And typically, if we want the reader to understand this well, we want to put that same information at the beginning of subsequent sentences. We've come across this in prior videos from this sequence with the idea that we're going to uh, put repetition throughout a particular paragraph. We talked about perovskites and, and solar cells in some earlier summary statements. And we, we looked at how when we 
um, put those same objects or subjects uh, many times throughout the paragraph, then the reader is going to start to um, come to terms and it will become old information to the reader. It will become part of the context. So repetition here brings about familiarity and it establishes that new information as old information. So one thing I want to be able to stress right now is that our writing is actually a form of teaching. And this is true of any discipline. We are going to be writing something down that somebody wants to read. They want to learn something from our, our writing. That's why they're going through to look at our prose. So consider the following. This is an example, right? Two sentences. The first sentence, the USA is a large country. The second sentence, Ndombele is more creative than Winks. What do we think about these two sentences? Well, if we think about the first sentence and on what we've learned from that first sentence, well, we kind of understand what's going on with this particular sentence, but we're not really learning anything new. We already know that you, the USA is a large country. However, we know nothing about Ndombele and Winks, but we're kind of learning something. We now know that Ndombele is more creative than Winks, but there's no context. We've no idea what this particular sentence is talking about, unless, of course, you happen to be a, a fan of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Um, you would not know that these two individuals, Ndombele and Winks, are two players from that squad. So because there's no context, we have no idea what that sentence is about. So what's the take home message here? So in order to teach, in order for someone to want to read your writing, um, readers want to learn something, but we have to integrate that new material with the old information, with the context. And uh, scientific writers often forget this. Um, we tend to be very um, deeply stuck into the science and we tend to think that the rest of the, the population often has the same understanding of things as we do. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, scientists often get a bad rap for their communication uh, to the world at large. So we have to always think about who our audience is and we have to always think about providing that context to link them to the new material that we've already established can be quite empowering to them. So scientific writers coming back to this point, they believe often that the connection is already made between the old and the new and we lose that context. So the bridge between old and new information must be strong. It, it must be front and center. Um, it's the first thing that a reader is going to think of, right? If, if we don't make that bridge between the old and new information, we will lose the reader completely. So how do we bridge this old and new information? What tactics can we use? We're going to now talk about chaining, and that's one way in which we can start to connect different ideas. So what is chaining? Well, very deliberately, chaining is the establishment of new information to be old, to be familiar to the reader. It's always going to be encouraged, but there are caveats, and we'll have a look at this. But let me describe chaining with this example. So I have a sentence, uh, or a few sentences here, here in this particular paragraph. The efficiency is driven by photo-induced charge transfer processes. You've seen that sentence already. So maybe already photo-induced charge transfer processes seems a little more familiar to you. We're actually going to start that uh, photo-induced charge transfer processes now as the subject in the following sentence. This, in a nutshell, is what chaining is. We end up introducing a new topic, a new idea, photo-induced charge transfer processes, and then we immediately use it again as the subject of the subsequent sentence. And then we can actually keep going on and, and doing this. So photo-induced charge transfer processes rely on a large donor acceptor energy gap. Well, we can repeat a large donor acceptor energy gap as the subject of the following sentence. And that's generated, a large donor acceptor energy gap is generated by increasing the excited state energy level. Well, of course, the excited state energy level in here can be raised by increasing the donor's electron density. 
same thing again. Now we're going to put the object of this sentence into the subject part of the subsequent sentence. The donor's electron density can be increased by pushing electrons into an aromatic system. So what we're doing here, just this is demonstrating chaining, we're moving from that object in the prior sentence, that object becomes the, sentence, the, the subject in the subsequent sentence. That is simply what chaining is. Is it effective? Chaining for knowledgeable readers is not really a problem. If um, you were all experts in organic photovoltaics, then the prior um, paragraph would seem very clear to you. However, if you're new to the topic, then readers will still lose some sense of flow from sentence to sentence. And therefore, we also want to remember a rule of thumb in here. So readers are going to get lost if we have more than three or four chained sentences. So that means, you know, immediately we're using that new information again in the subject form. It's asking the reader to do a little bit more work than really um, is acceptable. Nevertheless, the idea here is that we always must build on a stable base of old information that runs through most sentences. The more that we can repeat abstract concepts in certain positions within the same paragraph, the more familiarity the reader will have with those abstract concepts, especially if we need to get across or need to build on those abstract concepts uh, in the remainder of our writing. We have to keep in mind the reader's mind. We have to adapt to the reader's expectations. So we have to remember that a reader expects there to be old, familiar information in the topic position. Uh, and that topic position can be the first part of the sentence, or it can also be the first part of the paragraph. We need to allow the reader to you know, easily slide into the paragraph and the writing that we're putting towards them. If we put too much new information in the topic position, if we put that new information at the beginning of a sentence, that writing feels unclear, the reader is not going to understand. So with the familiar information in that topic position, with the old information in that topic position, with the context right up front, readers will start to look for more information. Um, they're looking for things that are worth knowing at the end of the sentence. It's a natural um, expectation for the reader. So the other thing to remember is that your readers will remember and take away new information from your text so long as it comes towards the end of the paragraph, so long as it's found in the object of your sentences. So put that new information later in your work. Let's think about a couple of key uh, words here. The beginning of the sentence is where we put the topic and the end of the sentence is the stress. And that stress is really the new information that makes the trip worthwhile for the reader. Lastly, we're going to finish off with the stress point. So this is really following from the last slide. What information or what opinion do you want for the, the reader to remember or leave with? And that is usually what, what we are doing as we are writing. We want to put forward a conclusion that that reader is going to walk away with and remember. So the stress point is what we're going to be talking about in this slide. Let's look at an example. Think about the new lab partner that you've been paired up with. So think about this person and, and think about two statements that might be provided uh, that inform you about this new lab partner. The first statement here, well, he's rather aloof. You know, he's cool and, and distant, and uh, but he's the best experimentalist in the group. And in the second statement, we're just flipping things around a bit here. He's the best experimentalist in the group, but he's rather aloof. What do you think about both of these statements? In A, we're left with the idea that the new lab partner is the best experimentalist in the group. This is clearly an asset to us. And that's what we tend to remember as we walk away from this statement. The second statement, of course, we're left recognizing or thinking that this individual is rather aloof and that maybe he's a liability. So clearly it matters the order in which we put information out there. Um, we tend to remember things from the end of sentences. These are the stress points in those sentences. Um, 
if you had done some work and um, you wanted to ensure you got the highest grade possible and you go to your professor and um, you make a plea, um, which response would you think would get you the best outcome out of the two statements that follow? Firstly, my writing is not perfect, but I deserve an A. And the second one, I, desire, I deserve an A, but my writing is not perfect. To follow up on the same theme of this slide, most people would think that you'd be more um, likely to get a better outcome if you choose um, option A in here and leave the stress point as that you deserve the A, despite the fact that your writing may not be perfect. So the end of the sentence is the part that you want to emphasize. So think about that as you finish key sentences and certainly as you finish a paragraph. So in summary, what have we learned in these three videos? So we're out here, generally speaking, to teach our audience. We want them to, to buy into what we're saying. And usually we might want certain, a certain outcome from our writing and from their reading. We've also talked about the importance of connecting ideas, right? So we are teaching our audience. We are connecting these ideas, these concepts, these characters, these actions. When we can do that, we make an impact on our audience. And this is the way in which we can get noticed through our writing. And this is the way in which we can stand up and be counted. So again, thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you next time.